So as Ned said, my name is Ned Batchelder. I'm Ned Bat on most social media, and there's a bit.ly short link there at the bottom of the slide that links to this talk online if you want to follow along with the slides. Um, and those two uh, short things will be at the bottom of most of the slides, too. So I've been writing software for a long time, and one of the things that interests me about writing software is that there are two mindsets that inform the process of writing software. The first is computer science, which is really a branch of mathematics, and so it's very theoretical. You do proofs. You think about very abstract concepts. The other mindset that informs writing software is software engineering, which is very pragmatic and is basically concerned only with whether you are writing software that works. How can we write software that works? And there is some crossover. Lots of computer science underpins software engineering, but we don't think about it every day. But there's a few topics that do cross over into the everyday of software engineering. And in particular, I'm interested in people who are working in software engineering who don't have formal computer science backgrounds and maybe feel a little bit insecure about that. And one of the things that they seem to feel keeps them from sitting at the grown-ups table is this thing called Big O. Now, Big O is really a simple thing. And I've made a rhyme here to help you remember what it is. It's about how your code slows as your data grows. And an English major friend of mine pointed out that the rhyme is on the O sound, like big O. And I didn't intend that at all, but that's cool. <laughs> so the question is, how does your code slow down as the data gets larger and larger? And this is not the same as the running time of any particular run of your code. We're not trying to measure the time in seconds. We're not trying to figure out exactly how many of them you can do in one transaction. We're talking about the trend over time, over many runs of your code. How does it slow down as the data gets larger and larger and larger? And one very pragmatic way to think about this is, let's say you have a chunk of code. You give it a certain amount of data. It takes a certain amount of time. How much longer will it take to work on 10 times as much data? If I give it 10 times as much data, how much longer does it take? And you might think intuitively, well, it'll take 10 times as long, obviously. But that turns out not to be true. Some code will take 10 times as long. Some code will take twice as long. Some code will take 100 times as long. And some code won't take any longer at all. And Big O is all about characterizing that growth of the time of the code as the, code, as the data grows, how the code slows as the data grows. And computer science people approach this topic in a very, very mathematical way. But software engineers approach it in a very, very pragmatic way. And I'm trying to, I'm going to explain the pragmatic approach. It doesn't have to be done in a mathy way. It can be done in a pragmatic way. So let's get some terminology out of the way. This is called the big O notation. And the way it's written is a capital O and a parenthesis, and then a bunch of stuff with an N in it and a closed parenthesis. OK? I told you it was simple. The N is meant to stand in for how much data you have. And the O stands for order of. And the idea is that we're talking about the running time of your code grows on the same order of some mathematical expression of N. The key thing here is although it looks like a function call, there's a name and then parentheses with stuff inside, it's not a function call. It's just a notation. And there's probably a mathy reason why it looks like a function call, but it doesn't matter. Just know that it's not a function call. It's just a way of labeling a piece of code as having a certain growth pattern. So let's take a real world example. Let's say we have to count the number of beans in jars. right? We've got this guy on the left. He opens up the jars. He starts pulling out beans one by one. right? We can see here n is the number of beans. right? If we give this guy a jar with 10 times as many beans, it's going to take him 10 times as long, obviously. Right? And he's sweating. Um, this is what's known as O of n, meaning that the time it takes to complete the task grows in the same way that n grows. It's on the order of n. If n doubles, the time doubles. If n is 10 times more, the time is 10 times more. And you might think, well, there's no other way to approach this task. But there is, of course. You get beans jars that have labels on them that tell you how many beans are in them. Right? This guy on the right has a much easier job. You can see how much happier he is about it. Because it doesn't matter how large a jar you give this guy on the right, it's going to take the same amount of time for him to tell you how many beans are in the jar. This is what's known as O of 1, which is kind of a weird mathematician's way of saying that n isn't involved at all. No matter what happens to n, the running time remains the same. O of n is, is slower in the long run than O of 1. 
and this is a silly, silly real-world example, um, but for instance, when you do for x in my list, you, do, you have an O of n operation because you have to look at every element in the list, every bean in the jar. When you do len of my list, you don't have to look at the elements of the list at all. Turns out Python lists are kind of like those jars on the right. The length of the list is written on a label on the outside of the list. And so no matter how long the list is, getting the length of the list is a constant time operation. Uh, by the way, these drawings were drawn by my son, who is uh, in art school. One thing you might not have noticed, if you look at their eyebrows, they're shaped like beans. <laughs> that's, that's art school for you. <laughs> All right, another real world example. Let's say I tell you I'm going to give you a book and I want you to find a certain word in the book, like horse. Right? If I hand you a novel, you're going to start reading until maybe you find the word horse. Right? This is, sounds like an O of N operation, again, right? because if I give you a novel that's twice as long, it might take you twice as long until you encounter the word horse. But let's say I give you a different book. I give you an encyclopedia. Now you open the encyclopedia to the middle. If the word you're looking for is earlier than that, then you do another divide and conquer step until you find the word horse. If I, now if I give you an encyclopedia that's twice as large, it's not going to take you twice as long. There's just one more divide and conquer step to find it. That's what's called O log of n, which is a fancy mathematician's way of saying that. So these are both real world examples of the kinds of tasks that sort of sound similar when you first hear them, but how you organize the data and therefore what algorithm you can use on the data really affects how the length of time it takes you to do the task changes as the size of the data changes. Right? That's what we're talking about, is how your code slows as your data grows. Let's get some other terms out of the way because I'm going to be speaking here and I might throw out some words that are a little bit different than earlier. When we say O of 1, we might call it, call it constant time. I might say that the labeled bean jars are a constant time algorithm because the time remains the same no matter what. O of n is often called a linear operation because if you look at it mathematically, it's, there's a, a linear relationship between the size of the data and the running time. O of n squared is a thing we haven't seen yet, but we will. Um, that's the case where you, when you give it 10 times more data, it takes 100 times as long to run, and that's called quadratic, because now you've got a quadratic equation involved. If you don't remember what a quadratic equation is, it doesn't matter. It's just a word that means n squared. And some other words for big O, it's sometimes called complexity, or time complexity, or algorithmic complexity, or if you want to sound really fancy, you can call it asymptotic complexity. It's all the same thing. Right? One of the underlying themes of this talk is that this, this, this topic of big O notation is littered with mathematical detritus that doesn't really matter to the key concept. And don't let that stuff throw you. That's just chaff being thrown at you by mathematicians. You don't have to let it throw you off the path. So how do you actually determine the big O of a piece of code? The first step is you figure out what code you're talking about. And that sounds kind of silly, but in a large system, there's, you might be looking at one function, and that might be the important thing, but it really might actually be important to consider all the callers of the function, or maybe you're looking at too large a chunk of code and you need to think about a small piece. If you're going to describe a piece of code, be very clear about what piece of code you're talking about. And then when you look at that code, you should figure out what n is. And I don't mean like whether it's 100 or 1,000. I mean, what is it measuring? So if you're you have some code that's iterating over all the records in a database, then n is how many records in the database. In our bean example, it was how many beans in the jar. If you're doing a string search, it might be the length of the string. And then here's where the real work comes in. You're going to think about that code running, and you're going to figure out how many steps there are in the code in a typical run. Now, let me tell you what I mean by typical first. There's two meanings of typical. One is, what kind of data is it going to get? In the real world, there's sort of real world data that kind of is what you kind of can expect. And then there's worst case data, right? A string of 40,000 spaces is not typical data. Typical data is, you know, last names. It's mostly ASCII, and it's about most to 15 characters long, that kind of thing. So you can think about what's your typical data. And then a, another meaning of a typical run is that over many runs of your algorithm, there's a certain number of times a loop might run or a certain length of string it might get. So you kind of think about the design center of your code. And you imagine running that code through that design center and you count the steps. And what I mean by steps is very vague. 
And in a way, a lot of this topic is very vague. There are no units in anything we're talking about. And the number of steps, it kind of doesn't matter what you count as a step, and it kind of doesn't matter that some steps might actually take longer than others, because really what you're thinking about is, if I'm doing n equals 10, I'll have this many steps. Now how many for n equals 100? And so that exactly what steps there are doesn't matter as much as how does that count grow? And I'll show you some examples so you'll get a sense of it. So you count the steps in a typical run, and since we put in n at the top and not 10 exactly, the number of steps is going to be ex an expression in n. You might end up with, well, it's 3n plus 47 steps, something like that. And then what you do is you keep only the most significant part of that expression. So you keep only the highest coefficient piece, and then you throw away the coefficients. So if you had 47n squared plus 53n plus 101, that's n squared. You throw away all the lower order components and the, expo and the coefficients. And the reason is that as n gets larger and larger and larger, the lower order components matter less and less. Right? 3n plus 1, the 1 is really important when n is 1, but when n is a billion, who cares about the 1? Right? We're trying to get to that long-term trend as the data gets very, very large. And if it's 3n, that doubles when n doubles, just the way n doubles when n doubles. So the 3 is irrelevant, too. So you get rid of the lower order components and you get rid of the coefficients. And what's left is your big O notation. Now let's look at some examples. True fact, I wrote this code in November and it didn't occur to me until I was lying in bed this morning that this code is about moms and it's Mother's Day. So here's an example of some code. What we're gonna do is we're gonna have a data structure called moms, which is a list of tuples. And the tuples are people and their mothers. Right? And then we're going to write a function called find mom. And find mom is going to take that list of moms in the name of a child, and it's going to find the child's mom. Okay? Now, if you think about searching through this list, in a typical run, in some runs you will find it in the first entry, in some runs we'll find it in the last entry. So on average, in a typical case, we'll find it about n over two times. We're going to look through half the list. So if we come down to this line, this loop is going to run n over two times. And I'm going to say that there are three steps in this loop. We have to get the tuple out of the list, and then we have to assign the child to child name, and we have to assign the mom to mom name. So there's three steps, which means that this line is going to contribute three times n over two steps to our count. This comparison, we're going to do n over two times, and there's only one step, so that gives us another n over two. And then this line is only going to happen once, because it's the end of the function, so that's going to give us one more step. And so what our total is going to be 3n over 2 plus n over 2 plus 1, which simplifies down to 2n plus 1. I said that we get rid of the lower order components, which is the 1. We get rid of the coefficient, which is 2. This is an O of n function. Right, so we've just determined that the algorithmic, the, sorry, the asymptotic complexity of find mom is O of n. And the way people say that in the real world in a cubicle is find mom is O of n, or find mom is linear. Find mom is O of n. Okay? And so you saw when we were going through the steps, we didn't really care which steps were expensive, which weren't. We, all we wanted to know is the relationship between the n and the number of steps, and when n changes, the number of steps is going to change, and that's what we're looking for. And notice we have no idea whether this is fast or slow. Right? We don't know whether this function is going to take a minute or a millisecond. All we know is that if we give it 10 times more data, it's probably going to take 10 times as long. Let's look at another example also about moms, the same, same data structure, the same mom's data structure. But now what we're going to do is we're going to write a function which tells us in that data structure how many grandmothers are there. That is, how many, peop how many people are mentioned both as a mom and as a child in our list, right? And so now we're going to go all the way through to the end of the list. And I mentioned that n over 2 before, but remember, we're throwing away coefficients, so in a way, the half never mattered. And as you work through this more, you'll sort of get a sense of what you can not collect in the first place because you're going to throw it away anyway. So for instance, this line is going to run n times. Right? And notice I didn't write 3 times n here because, like I said, we're throwing away coefficients. This is an O of n line. We're going to run this line n times. Now this line is going to run n times also, but it's calling a function, find mom, which we just determined was an O of n operation in and of itself. When you call it once, it's O of n, and we're going to call it n times. That's going to give us n squared. 
And we can continue on and say this is n, but remember, we're going to throw away the lower order components. We already found an n squared. It's kind of uninteresting to keep finding the n's. Right? But we're finding a bunch of n's. We're going to end up with n squared plus some number of n plus 1, which is O of n squared. Right? So find how many grandmothers is a quadratic function. It's O of n squared. Now, the ideal, of course, is O of 1, right? Constant time. You can do the same amount. You can work on any amount of data and not take it, have it take any longer. And it seems kind of impossible. Like, how could that be? But remember, we saw len of my list is O of 1, because no matter how long the list is, the length is written on the outside. We can just pick it up. That's kind of boring. Really interesting is the looking up a key in a dictionary is O of 1. No matter how many keys are in a dictionary, it's the, it takes about the same amount of time to look up a key as in a one-element dictionary and in a million-element dictionary, which is why dictionaries are heavily optimized and engineered and underpin every name lookup in Python, because they're fast. And we'll get back to why it is, but very quickly, it's because there's a thing called a hash function which turns a key into a number, and in typical data, the numbers are all different, and so you can very quickly use that number to find the place in the dictionary where the value is. Now, no discussion of, o of uh, big O notation would be complete without showing you the graph. Along the bottom, we have that flat green line labeled 1. Oh, the, the x-axis is data, so data grows to the right, and then the time grows going up. Um, so the big flat line at the bottom is O of 1. That looks great. Log n was looking through the encyclopedia. The linear line uh, going diagonally is O of n. And the big red one, n squared, just zooms li literally off the chart. Right? So the n squared is one of those bad things you try to avoid because it really grows really fast when things get big. Now, when we looked at our code, we have to understand what functions we're calling and how, what kind of complexities they're adding into our total function. This is a chart of the typical operational complexities of lists, dicts, and sets um, in Python. By the way, when people say dictionaries are O of 1, that sentence doesn't make any sense. Nouns like dictionary can't have an algorithmic complexity. Operations have an algorithmic complexity. So what you're supposed to say is that looking up a key in a dictionary is O of 1. Now you'll notice that a lot of these are kind of the same. Appending to a list is O of 1. Adding a key in a dictionary is O of 1. Adding a value in a set is O of 1. A big difference is looking up a value in a list is O of n. So if you're going to search for a value in a list, it's going to have to look at every element in the list. It's going to be that left bean counting guy with the sweat coming off of his forehead. But looking up a key in a dictionary or a value in a set is O of 1, which is why they're really, really uh, valued. Uh, so pro tip right off the bat, if you've got a program that's going too slow, look to see if you're looking up a value in a list and replace it with lookup in a set. But there are trade-offs. So when I say replace the list lookup with a set lookup, you've got to keep your eye on the big picture. And this is where understanding what piece of code you care about matters. So I said replace a list lookup with a set lookup. Let's say we have some code like this where we're going to make a list. We make a list, and then we try to find the thing in the list. And that line is O of n, right? We just saw that on the table of Python complexities. So you might think, well, I know what I'll do. I'll make a set instead, and then I can look it up in a set. That's good. If you can do that, that's good. So you don't make the list in the first place, you make a set. Bad is you go ahead and you make a list anyway, and then you convert it to a set, and then you do the lookup in a set, right? So now that last line is great, it's O of 1, but you've added a line before it, turning the list into a set, which itself is O of n. Like, literally, you've actually slowed down your program by a tiny amount. You still have the O of n operation of converting the list into a set. So it's very easy once you get into this algorithmic complexity stuff to get sort of focused on the little things and lose sight of the big picture, right? This would be a bad trade-off. A good trade-off would be even if you're making a list, if you can convert it into a set once and then do many lookups. So if you're going to do many lookups in your list, then it makes sense to turn it into a set once. And then you have, o of, you have one O of n and then many O of 1. And your program will go faster. So you always have to keep in mind what the real usage is of your code and where the time is being spent about where you're going to sort of work on reducing the algorithmic complexity and whether it's worth it. Now this is, don't read this code. The code doesn't matter. This is a real example of code that got me started down this path. This was from a project last summer 
The code on the left is shorter and has fewer data structures and fewer functions and, in fact, fewer loops, but it's slower than the code on the right. And the reason is that if we label things as O of n and O of 1, the code on the left has an O of n operation there because it's looking up a value in a list. The code on the right only has O of 1 operations. So the code on the right, even though it's longer and has more functions and more data structures and more loops, is O of 1, where the one on the right is O of n. And in fact, I was using it to draw drawings like this. These functions work over an entire list of points. And if you go up a level in the code, you'll see actually that that function is called once for each point in the list of points. So the O of n on our slow side was turning into O of n squared. And so the slow code was taking 20 seconds. The fast code was taking a half a second on only 2,000 points, right? I say, I'm, I've been giving examples like, oh, when n gets to a billion, n got to 2,000 here and made a huge difference in my running time. Because n squared is really worse than n. With an n of 2,000, n squared is 4 million operations, and o of n is 2,000 operations. And that's a big difference. So it really does pay off sometimes to reduce the algorithmic complexity of your code to reduce the running time. Now, we've been talking about O of 1 and O of n and O of n squared. There's more possibilities. So there's more possibilities of kinds of complexities you might encounter in the real world. Of course, there's O of n cubed and n fourth, right? If we called how many grandmothers once for every child for some reason, we'd have an n cubed operation. If I used that point algorithm once again for every point, I'd have gone back up on an n level. I'd add another coefficient to my n. You can also have worse things like O of 2 to the n. If you have n Boolean choices and you try all the combinations of them, you've got 2 to the n. If you have n things and you try to try all permutations of those n things, you'll have n factorial. So as bad as n squared is, there's sort of no upper limit to how horrible your code can get. <laughs> um, so think about how your loops are working, where, how much data you're working on, and keep an eye on where those complexities are getting really, really big. The other kinds of possibilities is there could be more dimensions. So we've been talking about doing algorithmic analysis where we have one variable, n. But you could have others, right? If I'm telling you that I've got a string search algorithm over some number of strings, I should, might be, also have to consider the length of those strings. Typically, they're fairly short, but if you're doing you know, BioPython or something, you have DNA samples that are millions of characters long, and then suddenly the lengths of the strings matter, too. For example, when I was doing that um, point uh, drawing uh, code, there was a line intersection algorithm that I found whose stated complexity was n plus k times log of n, where n is the number of lines and k is the number of intersections among those lines. And I don't know how to figure that out. That's like a mathy thing that you can just read about. I didn't have to figure out what that complexity was. Now, we saw this graph before. Algorithmic complexity really matters as numbers get large. But another place where you have to be careful not to overapply the idea is when numbers are small. So let's zoom in to that lower left-hand corner of, this, of the graph. If we zoom in there, suddenly the lines don't look so clear-cut. The green line is actually above the other lines for most of them. And the n squared line, that red line, is actually below everything for a lot of the time. And the reason is that when numbers are small, all those coefficients and lower order components that we threw away, those mattered, right? 3n plus 1, when n is 1, that 1 at the end really matters. And also, we haven't taken into account what the actual time of the steps is. You might have an n squared operation where you are doing n squared times a millisecond. And you might be comparing that with a constant time algorithm that always takes a minute. Well, n has to get pretty large before that constant time algorithm is worth it. When n is a billion, it's worth it. But when n is 10, you should stick with the n squared algorithm. So as Rob Pike once said, fancy algorithms are small when n is small, and n is usually small. So don't go overboard with um, trying to fancy up your algorithmic complexity. Um, it doesn't matter when n is small, and usually your n is small. All right, some advanced topics. There's a thing called amortization which is really a long-term averaging over operations. So when I say that appending to a list is O of 1, that doesn't mean that every single time you append to the list, it takes a small amount of time. In fact, it usually takes a small amount of time. But every once in a while, the whole list has to be copied and moved someplace else, which, is, which gets longer and longer as the list gets longer. But it also gets less and less frequent as the list gets longer, so that over the long run, the average is still O of 1. 
So amortization is a fancy word meaning averaging, and it means that individual operations can take different amount of times. Algorithmic analysis is really about the long-term trends over many, many runs. And we haven't talked about the worst case. So earlier we talked about the typical case, and some people think big O implies typical case or big O implies worst case. No, you have to say whether you're talking about the complexity of the typical case or the worst case. Here's an example where I make a set of 50,000 numbers which differ by 47. I'm kind of walking up the numbers by 47. Adding that number into the set is an O of 1 operation, so the whole building the whole set is O of n, and it took about 10 milliseconds. Here I'm building another set of integers exactly the same size, 50,000 numbers, but I happen to choose um, a step that I happen to know was going to make all the hashes exactly the same. So all the numbers got exactly the same hash, which turns it into an O of n operation, which means making this set took 34 seconds, 3,300 times longer. Dicts also have this problem, and people were using it to DDoS web servers, which is why Python added hash randomization. And it's a fascinating topic, but it's an example where, although dicts are O of 1 in the typical case, occasionally you have to worry about the worst case. And there's more math. So if you dig into the math, basically mathematicians have taken every letter that either looks like an O or sounds like an O and given it a meaning. And you don't need it. You don't need it at all. And so there might be mathematicians in the audience right now who are going to say, you know, you're not really even talking about big O. Yeah, shut up. I don't care. <laughs> we all, we all, this is, what we, this is what we mean by big O. And those experts, by the way, so I wrote a blog post when I was first starting to think about this with the same title, Big O, How Code Slows as Data Grows. And a lot of people liked it, but one guy wasn't so pleased. Um, he thought that not only had I gotten something wrong, but the thing I'd gotten wrong was so important that the entire blog post was something that I should be ashamed of. And I actually looked into it. I gave him the benefit of the doubt. I learned a little bit more about algorithmic analysis. I concluded he was actually wrong. He remains convinced he is right. The good news is I got another blog post out of it. So if on your journey to explore these things you find people like this, just walk around them and keep going. It doesn't matter. I mean, if you're into the math, go and do the math. But if you're just trying to do software engineering, it doesn't matter. All right, so in conclusion, big O is useful. It can help you understand how your code might perform when the data gets very large. It doesn't have to be complicated. It doesn't have to be mathy. And you can do the thing. Thanks. <laughs>